Well, again, it is good to be back with you this Easter Sunday evening, and we are so glad that you have joined us again as you uh, settle down into your homes, as you uh, lead worship together with your families, and as you buckle in and uh, get ready to hear God's word in a moment as, it, as it's proclaimed. But we hope that you join us now uh, with Easter celebration as we sing, He Lives and Also Christ Arose.
everyone. It is so good to be with you. Sadly, not in person, face to face, but it is good to be with you virtually this Easter evening. It is so good to be with you to get to look to God's word and get to just celebrate and praise the risen Savior. Uh, the tomb has been declared empty. Our Savior lives and he offers salvation to all who believe in his name. Um, if you will join us in this time uh, for a word of prayer before we jump into uh, the scripture today. Bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We thank you for this day that you've given, that you've blessed us with. Uh, we just thank you so much the fact that you've created us. Uh, thank you so much for your grace, even though we've uh, sinned against you, rebelled against you, we have fallen. You have, by your grace, um, already had a, the plan in place to save us, uh, to make the payment for our sin, uh, the only plan to reconcile us back to you. But we thank you for Jesus, um, who is perfect, who is your son, who is you, God, in the flesh. But we thank you for him coming, dying on the cross in our place, uh, taking the, our sin upon himself, and then receiving the wrath that was due to us. Uh, and we just thank you for the fact, though, of what we celebrate even today. We pray every day the fact that he is risen, uh, that he overcame sin, death, and the grave. Uh, and we just thank you for this um, salvation that he gives um, only through what he has done and only through him. We just come to you right now. We pray that we celebrate this uh, resurrection that is to come. Um, this resurrection living that you allow us to live in right now. Uh, and we also pray and we plead that if there's anyone right now that's searching, anyone right now with questions, um, anyone right now that might even be um, skeptical about all of it, um, that you would answer their questions um, through your word, uh, but that they would have an open mind, open heart to seeing the evidence, to seeing your truth, and that they would be saved even before it's too late, that they would call upon the name of Jesus, and that they would be saved. Please be with me as I speak your word, all of us, as we hear and as we live your word. In Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Well, again, it is good to be with you, and um, there's just so much that um, kind of was laid on my heart and kind of passed through my mind as we uh, were preparing for this Easter service, but uh, sadly can't share it all with you. But uh, we will look first to just a couple of things. We're talking about resurrection, right? We're talking about the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. Thank, thank the Lord for that. But I do want to jump back a little bit and look at another uh, resurrection that was even previous to this. But if you look in Scripture, you will see that um, God has the ability to do uh, something that only he can do. He has the ability to give life. He created life. He created all that we see, but we see him also having the ability to um, give resurrection, to give life even after death. Um, and we see that testifying to who he is. We see that testifying to the truth um, and credibility of the word that is spoken alongside that those miracles of even resurrection. But look with me, if you will, to John 11. We're going to look there real quick, real briefly, before we get into our main passage today. John chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. Uh, what we see happening here is that Jesus would perform uh, one of the three even just listed, uh, mentioned in Scripture, resurrections that he, um, that he performed. Um, we would see here, it says in 25, that even his friend Lazarus um, had passed away. His friend Lazarus had been dead for four days. Surely by now he stinketh, right? He was already in the tomb. He was already wrapped with this heavy uh, burial wrapping. But he comes to, uh, to them, even to his two sisters, Lazarus' two sisters, as they are mourning, as they are weeping. But he comes to, to um, the one and he says this. It says, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. He asked her, he says, believest thou this? 
She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which, which should come into the world, right? This, this Christ, this Messiah, this Savior, uh, the Son of God that was uh, prophesied in, in Old Testament Scripture that they were longing for to come because they knew that he was their only Redeemer, and that same truth is the fact that he had come, and he was showing himself to be who he claimed to be. But what he would do next was amazing. He would tell Lazarus to come forth from the tomb. They would move the stone before that, and he would say, Lazarus, come forth, and he would walk out and then walk out alive, resurrected. He had been dead for four days, and they tell him, them, he tells them to take the burial cloths off of him. So again, he testifies to who he is. Many of the Jews gathered around at that time would even then believe in Christ. But again, he's testifying to who he is, but something even more amazing than that, uh, than him performing a resurrection, but even in that, he shows the fact that he is, as he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He is the source of life. He is the source of life. Of resurrection. He is the one that gives it, right? He is the one that raises even from the dead, and that when we believe in him, we shall not die. Do you believe that? I pray that if you don't believe that now, that by the end of this message, you would see and that you would believe. But something amazing, he doesn't just resurrect um, three people uh, in his ministry, but get this, he would even um, he would even uh, prophesy of his own death, but also of his own resurrection. He said that he must be uh, rejected um, by even the leaders in Jerusalem and that he would die. And that three days later, though, that he would raise. He would even say that, that he, the sign that, they, that this uh, perverse generation would receive would be like the sign of Jonas or Jonah, in that he was three days in the belly of the well, so must the Son of God be three days in the belly of the earth, but then he would raise. The amazing testimony, my friend, of what we celebrate today is that he did raise. Matthew 28, fame few verses here. 28 and verse 5, it says, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye. Again, uh, they come to the place where they uh, had known that Jesus had been buried, uh, come to his tomb, and then what does it say, though? It says, fear, fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Crucified, died in our place. What does verse 6 say, though? It's, he says, he is not here, for he is risen. As he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay. Just as Jesus had said that he would rise from the dead the third day, that had come to pass. He prophesied his own death and his own resurrection three days later, and guess what? It came to fruition. Jesus, the good shepherd, as spoken in the book of John, the good shepherd which lays down his life for his sheep, says he has the power to lay it down. No man takes away his life, but he willingly lays it down, but he also has the power to bring it back, right? To lift up back his life up. But you just see a little bit, just wanted to proclaim that, his, his claim that he is the resurrection and he is the life, and that claim was definitely proved. But let's just look at a little bit more of that proof. A little bit more of that proof of the resurrection. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, we'd actually gone through this a, a while back, even in our, 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 our BT or our night study um, for our Sunday night study. We went through all of 1 Corinthians, but 1 Corinthians 15 definitely comes to mind when we're talking about the resurrection. But we just wanted to dig a little deep and bring out some of the implications of the resurrection implications of 
the testimonies that were proclaimed about the resurrection. If you have any doubt, as you look at the context of this, um, you would see that some of these people in this church at Corinth, they were doubting. There's people coming in and telling them and convincing them to doubt even the resurrection of the saints to come, right? So Paul was specifically teaching uh, this to correct that wrong notion. But if you also are even here today and uh, you have doubts of even the resurrection of Jesus, I believe that this strongly testifies to the event. So now look with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. He presented this gospel, this good news, you received it, and you stand in it now. But it says this, it says, By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Do not believe in vain. Do not forget what you were once delivered and, and once believed. It says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. We even pause there and just get a little bit of a little bit of um, uh, explanation there of what we just read. Know this, that that gospel, that good news was delivered to them, but it's delivered to you. That gospel, that good news, you might even say the best news ever, that Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah, God in the flesh, came and died in your place, took your sin, my sin, upon himself, and then received all the punishment, all the wrath due to that sin. He died in your place. He died in my place. And this was prophesied. It was spoken of uh, beforehand. Um, it was proclaimed that Jesus would do this very thing, that he would die in your place. We just mentioned some of the uh, prophecy talking about his resurrection, him even prophesying his own uh, resurrection, but also uh, I want to ask you to uh, even think about this uh, of, of the prophecy that was proclaiming about Jesus's crucifixion. Was it at all spoken of in the Old Testament? Just venture with me now, if you will, to Psalm 22. But get this, Psalm 22, this was prophecy written about 1,000 years before Jesus would go even to the cross. And a long time before even crucifixion was even invented and used as a death punishment. But it says in Psalm 22, just going to read a few scriptures here. But again, this was written 1,000 years before any of this even happened. Uh, it was prophecy given of God of events that were to come to pass in the future. But imagine this. Tell me what you visualize as if this psalmist was not even at the foot of the cross, watching it for himself, and then writing down what he saw. But it says here in verse 1 of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Again, Jesus would have to uh, undergo this by himself. The Father could not be with him at this very moment when all of the sin was laid upon him and all of the wrath and punishment for that sin was poured out. What does it say in 14? Jump down to 14 of Psalm 22. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. Crucifixion was designed even to have them hang there and for even their uh, joints to be popped out of place. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Even towards the end of his crucifixion, his even heart would burst. He would suffocate and even go through this process as well. Verse 15, it says, My strength is dried up like a pot sherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust 
of death. Again, it was the Father's will for Jesus to go to the cross because it was the only way of our redemption, the only way of our salvation. He would be there in thirst. His strength would be completely taken from him as he was for hours on the cross um, going through all the torment that the cross held. What would he say then in 16? For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. Again, imagine all the dogs even feasting on, sad to say, this was a, this was a horrible sight. Uh, the, uh, the place of Golgotha, the place of the skull, even the dogs feasting on uh, the dead people who were crucified before that were just thrown out on the side of the hill. But also the dogs of, of men, even the assembly of the wicked have enclosed him, were circled about him, were even in the process of mocking him. What does it say the rest of 16? It says, they pierce my hands and my feet. Marks of the crucifixion that was at this time not even invented. Um, he would even have these marks and he would show the ones who would see him resurrected, see the nail prints in his hands and in his feet, see the uh, piercing in his side from the spear. Verse 17, uh, I may tell all my bones, I can even see my bones again as they uh, beat him with, uh, with a whip and they ripped, and his scourging as they ripped flesh from his ribs he could even see his bones, his ribs. It says they look and stare upon me as he is lifted up and all those gathered around are looking upon him. Some mocking, most mocking, but even his mother and some of his family were even beholding him. It says in 18, it says, they part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. They split part of his garment, but his other garment that was uh, one solid piece had no sewn marks in it. They would gamble for it, just as prophesied. What, is, what else does Scripture say? What else does the Old Testament Scripture say even about Jesus' crucifixion? Isaiah 53. We'll just uh, read uh, just a few verses here, but go back and look at the latter part of uh, Isaiah 52 and look at 53 and uh, just imagine uh, what is being told there and just really the glimpse of the future event that was going to happen some 1,000 years later, some 1,000 years later. But what, is, what does it say? Oh, excuse me, some 700 years later. But what, would it, what does it say here in verse 5? It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Beautiful gospel. Verse 7. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He willingly went to the cross. He is the only reasons, is the only reason that we could have peace with God. He is the only reason that our transgressions our iniquities are paid for and are covered and it was all by his wounds it was all by his bruises it was all by his chastisement it was all by his stripes that even he took in the process of crucifixion but even the beautiful gospel even in six it says all we like sheep have gone astray we've all turned everyone to his own way and the lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all beautiful gospel and the fact that what we mentioned earlier we are sinners we are by nature sinners and by choice 
daily we are sinners, but by the grace of God, he laid our iniquity on him and Jesus paid the price for us that we may be redeemed, that we may live again. Beautiful gospel. If you will, jump back with me. So again, he's telling you, look, this, this gospel in, in, in 1 Corinthians 15, go back to where we left off. But again, he just said, look, this is a saving gospel. This is the good news that Jesus died in your place, but also that he was resurrected and all of it was prophesied. Get this, over 300 prophecies Jesus would fulfill. 300 things in the Old Testament that happened before Jesus even came on the scene, it would be prophesied that the the Messiah would fulfill these things. Many of these things are detailed, and guess what? Jesus fulfills them to the T. He is who he said he was, Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah and Savior. But what does it say next? In verse 5, it says, look, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Now it's talking about people even um, seeing, being eyewitnesses of the resurrected Jesus. After Jesus died, they saw that, look, this prophesied of his resurrection actually came to fruition. It says, It says, after that, look, after Cephas and after then the twelve saw him, after that he was seen of above 500 brethren even at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep or some have died. It says, "And, and last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due season. For I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believe. Just imagine that for a minute, everything that he just said. Look, if you're doubting even the resurrection to come of the saints or even if you're doubting the resurrection of Jesus, look, you heard the, you heard the gospel, the good news proclaimed by the eyewitnesses that they saw the resurrected Savior. Over 500 different people saw Jesus resurrected. Some of them would spend a great deal of time with him as he would teach them more things from the scriptures, as he would even eat with them, as he would walk with them, them even see the scars in his hand, and then they would later see him ascend up into heaven of which like manner he will later descend back to receive us. But just imagine this for a moment. He he says, look, if you doubt it, go ask the some 500 of many of which are still alive. If you doubt it, go ask them. Go ask them the testimony of what they saw. Not mentioned here in this this, uh, passage, but uh, later we'd even see Stephen even as he is being martyred for the good news of what he is proclaiming, that Jesus died, but that also he raised, he would be dying for the testimony. But also, what would we see? He would then see even the, uh, the Savior then. He would see a glimpse of him then. Not only resurrected, but ascended Jesus. Uh, who else would see him? We would also know that, that John, the revelator, In the last bit of revelation that God would give, even revelation of Jesus Christ himself, that that, um, John would even see him, right? And then he uh, he would even see him, he would receive this revelation from him 
uh, that God was wanting to reveal and be recorded even for us. He would say this in Revelation 1 and 17. This is the uh, what, what is being spoken here in Revelation. It says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. It says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Jesus brought victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave. And he is, he is revealing these things that only God could know, and he is revealing these things to John, which you see in the book of Revelation. But again, what do we see uh, transpiring now, even in our, in our main, main passage uh, we would see even Paul, Paul is the one speaking this, this uh, um, epistle to this church, speaking this uh, epistle to us, uh, but he is, he's telling them, I even saw him, right? So even while Saul was on the road to Damascus, before he was the apostle Paul, before he was saved, he was on the road to Damascus, right, with a decree in hand that was giving him permission to round up the Christians to be sent to the slaughter. So now, talking about testimony, evidence of the resurrected Jesus, Saul was strongly, zealously persecuting the church, but he encountered the resurrected Jesus. And he gets saved and is now one of the most sold-out believers of all time, preaching the gospel suffering for the gospel, the, the good news of which he knew he had seen. But he says, look, he says, he says uh, this is all by the grace of God. What, what does it say next, though? Continue on in our main passage, verse 12. Verse 12, it says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you, that there is no resurrection of the dead. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? So he's saying this, look, if, if uh, you uh, are believing that, that the dead will not rise from the dead in the future resurrection, then how do you even believe that Christ has risen from the dead? But then he goes into this next, uh, this next uh, place of scripture where he would tell them the implications, look, if you don't believe that there's a future resurrection, you don't believe that, there's, that Christ would even resurrect. And here's the implications of that. Verse 14, it says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? Is it vanity? Is it worthless? Does it mean nothing? And your faith is also vain, empty, or worthless? Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. He says, we look the preachers of the gospel. Are we not liars then? If Jesus, if there's no future resurrection and Jesus hadn't resurrected. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ. Whom he raised not up. If so, be that the dead rise not. Look, if you don't believe that the dead are going to rise then you shouldn't believe that Jesus rose. And if Jesus didn't raise, then we're all liars. He says, for if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. You are yet in your sins. Very strong implications here. Look look, look what is being said. Look, if Jesus did not raise from the dead, Your faith is worthless. Your faith is misplaced. You are, get this, you would still be in your own sins. You would be lost and in your sin. You would also have a future condemnation coming. But thankfully, even in Romans 4.25, 
we would see, you guys get this, that Jesus' resurrection even justifies us. A dead Savior is no good to the world. But the fact that the Savior that died for our sins on the cross also raised himself from the dead, he was raised up again on the third day, you can now be justified. It testified that, look, that payment for sin was accepted and that he overcame death, hell, and the grave. It also ensures our eternal life, his resurrection. It says in John 14, 19, beautiful scripture here, pretty much it says, because I live, you also will live. Because I live, you also will live. What, what other implications? If, if you were to believe that there's no future resurrection that Jesus didn't raise, what other implication? Verse 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. So those who have died in Christ, those that have died and their faith was in Christ, it says they're perished. Clearly we know they've, they've physically died, but no, it's talking about an eternal perishing. It says, look, if there's no resurrection and Jesus wasn't resurrected, then those who have already died and their faith was in Christ They are in hell, right? And that would be the future for anyone else who was to place their faith in Jesus if he were not raised. What does it say next? 19, it says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. We should be pitied. Um, the most that anyone could pity anyone, right? Because if our faith is, is only in this life, if our hope in Christ is only in this life, even though Christ gives, um, gives direction for us in his word to live an abundant life even here and now, even that, though that be the case, if we had no hope for eternity, if we had no hope after the grave, we are miserable. We should be pitied above all men, right? If this was it, and this is where all our hope ends, we should be pitied. What does it say next? Thankfully, it doesn't end there. Verse 20, it says, but, but now is Christ risen from the dead. However, the fact is that Christ is risen, amen? And became the first fruits of, of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Amen. It also would say in 45, we won't get to that place, but I'll mention this scripture, 45 of the same chapter. It says, and so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Jesus is life and resurrection itself, right? So the amazing thing is that even though Sin entered by one man and death then came by sin. Thankfully, even by one man, Jesus Christ, resurrection and life would be freely offered and given to all who would believe in his name. Believe the good news that was proclaimed about him, that he died on the cross for you and that he raised again the third day and that you would call out and trust in his name. What does it say next? It says, but every man in his own order, Christ the first first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power for he must reign till he hath put 
all enemies under his feet. Pause there for a second. What does he say next? Is look, there's there's an order to everything. Jesus Christ would be the first fruits of resurrection. He had raised some, even in his life and his ministry, he had raised some from the dead, showing his power and authority, but those men would later experience death again, right? But with Jesus, he was the first to be raised after death to never more die. He is living forever. And then it says, look, all those who trust in him will also be raised, would also be raised. He lives, and because he lives, all those who believe in him would also live. Amen. But it, it says, look, um, but he says that, that resurrection, that future even resurrection would even happen. Then he's also going to, also the end's going to come. And then he, when he conquers everything, when he finishes everything, he will deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. The amazing thing, even in all of this love and all of this redemption of mankind, he is still going to give it all to the Father, to give the Father the glory. Right? So then it says, look, when he conquers all of it, when it's all finished, we even see these things, there. it's a done deal even now. His victory at the cross of Calvary and his victory over the tomb, it's a done deal. He has been given all authority and power and he sends us out to proclaim that gospel. But we even see in the very end, it says, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed, in verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he that put all things under his feet, but when he, he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest, it is shown that he is ex- accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So again, he's going he's gonna to give all this glory to God. But what does it say next? Verse 29, next, next part of the scripture. But get this notion, if Jesus is not raised and us not promised the, uh, the resurrection to come, why would we do what we do? And you'll see this in verse 29. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all, why then? Why they then baptize for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by my rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it me? What advantage is it to me? What does it profit me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived. Evil corruption corrupteth good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So what is he saying here? He says, look, if there's really no resurrection from the dead, why would I put myself in jeopardy every single hour? Why would I risk death every single day? And is this what Paul went through? It sure is. Even even 2 Corinthians 11, he says this in 23, it says, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in laborers more abundant, this is he, he labored even more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a, a night and day 
I have been put in the deep at sea, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, his own countrymen were against him, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness. He went through much weary and pain. In watchings often, he would often stay up at night to actually protect his own life that no one would attack him and kill him. In hunger and thirst, in fasting, fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So I would ask this question. If Paul really did not see the resurrected Savior in whom he said he had seen, why would he in his right mind put himself in jeopardy every hour? Why would he go through the laundry list of what we just saw that he went through, risking his life every single day for the gospel, weary and in pain, And then also all those things, but on top of all those things, still having love and compassion for the churches and writing to them truth and encouragement and hope of this resurrection to come. Why would he he go through all that trouble? I pose that same thing to you now. Even as we saw it the first part of 1 Corinthians 15, that whole list of believers that had seen the resurrected Jesus, the one that they knew died, that they knew was buried, but then after the third day he rose again and showed himself even for many days to the people. Why would they proclaim the gospel that they they saw the resurrected Savior? Why would they do that? On top of that, they didn't just do that with no harm to themselves. Many of them would die for what they said they saw. Many of them would die for what they said they saw, including Paul, the Apostle Paul. So again, I challenge you with that question. It's not even logical that they would proclaim this gospel if they did not truly believe there was a resurrection to come, and if they truly did not believe that Jesus himself was resurrected. But he even says this, look, if, if that was the case, if, if there's no resurrection, then it would just be uh, just as good to let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Let us live the heathen life if there was no resurrection, if there was no life after death. But, Thankfully, that's not the case. But he says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So again, if if people are trying to uh, draw you away from the faith, if people are trying to tell you that this future is not coming, if people are trying to discourage you from living a godly life that is pleasing to God, if someone is trying to crush your hope, to crush your faith, it says, be not deceived, evil corruption, evil communication corrupts good manners. Be on guard. Know the discouragement and influence that is coming to your life. And be of caution. So now, if you will, we've we've looked at some of these things that were proclaimed here in the scripture. We looked at some of these amazing and great things, uh, and it doesn't end there. I just want to share one more bit from 1 Corinthians 15. Drop down to verse 50. Go back, please, in this time and read what what we didn't pick up. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Look, we in our broken sinful body right now, we cannot enter into heaven unless something 
else happens, unless something else changes. Verse 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Get this, this amazing resurrection to come. We're celebrating Jesus' resurrection right now, but he is also promising you that amazing resurrection to come. It says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on in- incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, sing this with us even now. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. The resurrection is a reality. It's a done deal. Jesus is already the first fruits. Jesus already rose even Many passed away saints, even in that day, right after his resurrection. Many of these people, uh, even the ones proclaiming this gospel to us, even the Paul proclaiming these epistles and truth to us, they saw the resurrected Savior, and they gave their lives for what they said they saw. Many of them were even told, look, you recant what you believe you saw, you recant Jesus, and I'll let you live. But they chose to stick with their faith in the resurrected Savior. They would pretty much say and know this, what is the worst you could do? Even if you kill me, which they did, that would lead them into the prize. That would lead them even into seeing Jesus face to face in an eternal heaven and a life forever. So I I just challenge you, think about what we've heard today. Think about this amazing message that God has preserved and given to you today. That these men would not die for a lie, but they would die for what they knew to be true. They would truly know that they had life awaiting. Even celebrate today, even in this fact, that if you believe in Christ, if he is where your hope is, you will one day even sing this song, death is swallowed up in victory, oh death, where is your sting? Death, your sting is taken away. Death cannot hold you. O grave, where is thy victory? The grave will not keep you, just like it didn't keep Jesus. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. We are only, anyone is only um, condemned because they have sinned. And the law speaks, the word speaks that all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory, And the wages, the law says the wages of sin is death. So we've all sinned. We all rightly deserve death and hell. But thankfully, by the gift of God, he offers eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through who? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. We were talking about Paul, talking about even his history. That that right there is even a testimony to you and to me of him truly knowing the resurrected Savior that he had seen. 
He was once persecuting the church very zealously, believing what he did was right. But when he saw the resurrected Savior, his mind quickly changed. He would then give his life to, again, proclaiming the gospel that we hear even today. But he, he would even in Philippians 3, he would go through a laundry list of his accolades, even of his religious accomplishments. He would say, look, if anyone would have confidence in the flesh, if anyone would have confidence in their own actions and their own accolades, their own accomplishments, he should even have more so. His zealous, uh, zealously persecuted the church. His righteousness with the law, he, was, he would be considered blameless. He was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. But what? But what things were gained to me? What did it profit me? Those I counted loss for Christ. He laid it all down. He knew the risen Savior that he saw. Otherwise, why would he lay down everything that he had built up? He had it going for him, worldly speaking. It says, yea, uh, doubtless, right? And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all these things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. I challenge you right now, my friend, where is your trust? Paul knew better. Paul knew that all of his accolades, all of his accomplishments were worthless. It gained him nothing. He could not work his way into heaven. He could not be good enough to outweigh his bad and, and, and earn passage into heaven. He could not do any of that. But all of his confidence, all of his trust, was placed in Jesus and Jesus' righteousness. All of his faith was in what Jesus has accomplished on the cross and Jesus' resurrection. So I challenge you, my friend, right now. If you're here today and your faith is somewhere else, I pray that it would be in the risen Savior, the one, the only way to heaven. The one and only way that your sin is going to be forgiven and your sin be removed. If you're here today and you are, you are questioning, you're doubting, maybe you're searching, I pray that you've heard eyewitness testimonies of the risen Savior and that you would place your faith in Jesus. Because I guarantee you, it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. We all die, we know that. But there is a judgment after that. And you are either going to plead at that judgment, I'm covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and you will enter into life everlasting, or you will say that you have not placed your faith in Jesus, and you will have condemnation in hell rightfully waiting but my friend i plead with you i pray that even right now that you know that this is good news that this is the best news ever that jesus did die in your place and he wants you even right now to trust in his son and to be saved because he lives we may also live all of us that trust in jesus as savior bow with me if you will Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you right now. We thank you for your word, uh, your amazing word, your amazing gospel. But we thank you that this gospel, though, is, 
written, it's recorded, it's given to us, but it is also a, a man, it is also Jesus. That good news is that, that Jesus came, he died for us, but also that he is raised again. He is currently at your right hand, and he will also come again. All of us who believe in the name of Jesus, that trust in him, we have eternal life given to us and awaiting. We come to you right now praying that all would receive Jesus and that all of us as believers, that we would celebrate of the resurrection of Christ, that we would celebrate of the resurrection, newness of life, living that you give us the ability to walk in each day now, that we also celebrate in the resurrection that is to come, that we know that we have confidence that we will have life eternal with you in heaven and in perfection. But we also come right now rejoicing that we know that any labor that we have in your name is not in vain. We have so much in Christ. We thank you in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great night. Celebrate with your family. Worship with your family. Let that affect every day in each day this week and through the rest of your life. The truth of the resurrection. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. Contact us if you need absolutely anything. But until then, we love you and we're praying for you.